We're now ready to go to 2D images. Um, and by the way, this is a general rule in a lot of topics in image processing, image analysis, computer vision, is thinking about and deriving and getting all the details and co concepts right in the lower dimension is typically much easier because what's gonna happen as we go into higher dimension, and this is by way of a warning, is that notation gets heavy, uh, but once we've got it in our heads in the lower dimension, this is gonna become much, much easier. So let's go back to where we started. Discrete time signals, images now, and discrete time uh, sy uh, systems. So first of all, what is an image? It's just a bunch of discrete time signals stacked together uh, top to bottom. So think again of each row of an image as one of our discrete 1D discrete time signals. So I'm gonna do everything in grayscale, by the way. Color is what? It's just a bunch of these packed together. So think about a color image as three of these discrete time images, red, green, and blue. And for our purposes, we're gonna treat everything as grayscale, and then we just operate on the color channels separately. So what is a discrete time image? It's f of x, y. Same square brackets as before, that hasn't changed. x, of course, corresponds to the horizontal. y corresponds to the vertical position, uh, column, row. And now I just have a matrix instead of a array or vector of values where I have rows, columns, and rows of values. If I have an 8-bit grayscale image, those values are 0 to 255, or if they're normalized units, they're 0 to 1. We know we're going to need it, so let's go ahead and define it. We need the unit impulse. And so now the unit impulse is, of course, a two-dimensional um, signal, so delta of x comma y, that is equal to 1 at the center of the image, um, there's that white pixel right there, and zero everywhere else. So imagine a, an n by n, or in this case, an m by n Im image, where every pixel is zero and one pixel in the center is one, or if you want 255, we'll use un um, normalized units here because we're talking about the impulse. Um, and notice, by the way, that I haven't set that at zero now the way I was doing with the signal. I've set it at the center of the image, um, typically because we count images, as you can see here, from 1 to m and 1 to n, and I just wanted it to be at the center of the image. So it's 1, the unit impulse, when x is m over 2, and y is equal to n over 2, the center of the image. Now, let's not worry about odd dimensions. It does, it's not going to matter for, for what we're going to do now. So good. I've got a discrete time image, packed together a bunch of numbers into a matrix, into a matrix of values. I've got my 2D unit impulse, which is 1 at the center of the image, and 0 everywhere else. Now, what do we know? Well, we have an intuition that the linear time invariant systems for images is going to be pretty similar to signals. And so let's go ahead and play the game. So I've got my discrete time image here. I've got my 2D unit impulse here. And let me define now a linear time invariant system. So again, remember that T is the system. F of XY is the input image. And G of XY is the output image. Okay. T, of course, is linear and time invariant, just like before. And so now we're going to play the same game. Let me remind you of what linear time invariance means. It means that if I give it as input the sum of two scaled images, F1 and F2, scaled by A and B, it is the same as if I had given it F1, given it F2, T of course, processed them through the linear, through the linear time system, and then multiply the outputs and then sum them together. So that is where I scale and, and, and sum doesn't matter. Do it for the input or do it for the output. That's the linearity property. The time invariance property is the same thing. Take an image and shift it in the horizontal and vertical direction and feed it to the linear time invariant system. It's the same as taking the output of the unshifted image and just shifting that and that's what this notation says here. Notice this is exactly the same as before. I just have two shifts here now, x0 and y0. And I'm just saying that the output at any position with any shift, x0 and y0, is the same as shifting the input by the same amount. So now, let's, so now we, we have our linear time invariant systems in 2D. Now let's ask, um, let's look at that same representation of a discrete image in terms of scaled and summed unit impulses, now 2D impulses. 
So I think we can agree that any image, f of x, y, can be written now as a double sum. And now, by the way, my sums aren't minus infinity to infinity because I have a discrete uh, lattice from 1 to m and 1 to n of scaled f of j, k, there it is right there, delta shifted by j and by k. And this should look really familiar. Um, if I just knock out that y, I knock out the k, and I knock out the y and the k here, I'm back to a 1D convolution. So this is just a 2D convolution, where now I'm representing my image as sums as, uh, of scaled unit impulses. Again, seems like a trivial thing to do, except when we put that representation into that LTI, we're, of course, again, going to get our convolution sum. So same game as before. If we take this representation and we put it into a linear time invariant system, then what's going to happen is that our output is going to be a sum um, of scaled versions of the unit impulse response. And I won't derive it because it's, it's just numerically a little messy, um, but it's exactly the same thing just from 1D to 2D. And again, H now of X comma Y is what happens when you feed that 2D unit impulse into the linear time invariant system, and it fully characterizes the linear time invariant system both for signals and for images. All right, so you can see, by the way, why we started in 1D and not 2D. That's a lot of notation, but conceptually, it's exactly the same thing. I'm going to take a discrete time image, and I'm going to represent it seemingly trivially, I will admit, as a sum of these simple little uh, signals, these impulses. But then when I take that underlying representation and I feed it into these linear time invariant systems, what comes out is something super cool, which is I only need to know the output to that, to that single impulse and that fully characterizes the system. And now I can throw away the system, only holding on to the unit impulse response, and I can mimic that response over and over and over again. Now, what we haven't seen is, well, what are these unit impulse responses? Like, what, what, are, what, like what, does, what does a time invariant system even embody? Is it something trivial or is it something interesting? That's to, to come next. Um, but right now, please make sure that you understand that algebra that we went through, of course, in 1D first and then in 2D. We're going to see the graphical representation to make sure we have the same picture in our head of how convolution works. And then we'll really start talking about what these things really are and what they can do to images and why they are interesting to us.